This is Agriculture Adapts by Climate AI. Every week, we speak with industry-leading executives, farmers, and academics to get a 360 view of how the agriculture sector is innovating to stay ahead of a changing climate. I'm your host, Borna Porshikani. And I am your co-host, Himanshu Gupta. We are a team of climate scientists and agriculture entrepreneurs trying to make farming more resilient, profitable, and equitable as we transition to a new age of agriculture. This podcast is our journey as we explore the hurdles and opportunities that lie ahead for the industry that feeds the world. Hello, hello, hello. We have another exciting episode teed up for you all today. Uh, a few episodes back, we spoke with Peter Mandabi, the co-proprietor of Charles Krug, one of the oldest wineries in Napa, about the impacts of climate change on the wine industry. Um, wine is a fascinating ag product, and there's so much to learn, so we naturally had a ton more follow-up questions after that amazing conversation and just wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So we recruited someone to join us who has a slightly different angle of expertise. With us today is AJ Ferrari, a wine sommelier or a wine expert. He is the Ohana Floor Culinary Manager at Salesforce and a wine instructor at Stanford University. Thanks for joining us today, AJ. Thanks for having me. So I think a good place to start uh, is to sort of just hear about your background, how you came to be a sommelier, what made you want to do that, and just what your personal story is. My personal journey started as a small kid uh, in Pennsylvania. My grandfather made uh, wine uh, that he used uh, for the church that they belonged to. My father kind of picked up the practice as well and was making wine more for his, uh, his personal temple. And so we got to experience that as a kid, moving wine barrels around and from different uh, carboys uh, and uh, different vessels and different, you know, just the whole process. It was very low tech. I moved then to San Francisco when I first turned 21 and I got a job for a wine shop called DNM. Uh, at the time, it was one of the top wine shops in the country, really specializing in uh, single malt scotch, French brandy, champagne, and boutique California wines. And I was just at the right age to really dive into it because I had just turned 21. I was very excited. There's tons of opportunities and tastings. I was new to San Francisco. So it was just a real education um, in the industry. I moved uh, on from the, that position and I w- ended up working at the Wine Spectator magazine in their tasting department for their uh, editor, uh, Harvey Steinman, who was at the time in charge of Australia, New Zealand, Oregon, and Washington wines. So I helped him put on his tastings, uh, tasted the wines with him, and kind of uh, edited and polished up his notes and sent them to New York. Left that job and uh, to travel for quite a bit. And during that travel, I spent uh, some time in New Zealand doing a little vineyard work and then in Australia working what's called a harvest. So that's when the grapes are all being harvested and brought in and you're changing the juice to actual to wine. Uh, So I did that and then uh, eventually back into the States where I started getting into kind of helping out a couple different wineries here in Napa. Uh, Green and Red was one uh, that was a really great experience Uh, and I built off that experience that I had in Australia where you know, previously I could tell you exactly how wine was made, but I, I couldn't go into detail because I, I just had a, you know, kind of a light understanding and it really helped kind of broaden my knowledge. Came back to the States then and, uh, or still, and uh, got into running wine programs for restaurants. So kind of uh, helping them source wines, buy wines, spirits, uh, putting the bar list together, thinking about by the glass kind of programs. And that's really when I started kind of getting into that world of being a SOM or sommelier. Left there, uh, came, uh, that that was up in Napa uh, in Sonoma, actually, and came back to San Francisco where I worked for uh, a bunch of different wine ventures, then ended up moving toward being a sommelier at a restaurant called Cortez. I left there to go to Michael Mina restaurant where I stopped being a on-the-floor sommelier, but really got involved with the wine and spirits program from behind the bar. Uh, left uh, that group, uh, went to work for another bar organization uh, in San Francisco, and then on to Salesforce. So it's always been, uh, always been kind of professionally in the industry. Sorry, I know that's long. Can you just clarify for people what it means to be a sommelier? Because I think for some, at least, at least for me, I've heard of like the master sommelier, and I've, I think I've watched like a Netflix documentary on it before. But what does it mean to be a sommelier? Sure. Uh, I mean, the term sommelier means that you're a wine buyer. It was typically applied to a wine buyer who was buying wines for a hotel or a restaurant. Um, 
And so anybody who's in that position could call themselves a sommelier. And then there is different types of credentialing that you can do. Um, there's the Wine and Spirits Education Trust that registers you as a level one, level two, level three sommelier. And you go through that process to then possibly get to that point you were talking about, a master sommelier. And there's a movie, uh, a couple of them now, but one, Psalm, uh, is a great one. A bunch of friends of mine are in that. And uh, that kind of talks you through or walks you through their journey and uh, the, the pressure and anxiety involved in uh, to get to that level. Tell us about your class at Stanford. You know, during that process that I was talking about of all those different kind of wine jobs, uh, I uh, started teaching here at Stanford. So I found out about it. Uh, I answered an ad on Craigslist. It was very simple. And, uh, you know, the class is, there's no major here your own viticulture or enology. These are one credit classes. So they fall really more into the category, which I like to call them of like life skills. So here we learn how to, I teach the class how to talk about wine, how to think about flavor, how to um, just process that information that then they can communicate it back to uh, going to a restaurant and, or going to a wine shop and having a little bit more to say in the situation uh, that might actually mean something. So I think one of the things that interested us originally about wine in particular is that if you look at the agriculture space, everyone is dependent on weather and climate. But if you look at the wine space in particular, there's this concept of terroir where people really care a lot about the soil, the region, what the climate's doing. Um, and it seems to kind of be front and center when you're thinking about the end product. How does the terroir affect flavor and how should people think about this concept of terroir? Well, terroir really means a sense of place. So... Uh, we all have it, and all the products we eat kind of have uh, some terroir for the most part, and it's going to be represented in wines by the angle of the sun, where where those grapes vines are located, uh, amount of days of rain that particular year, that type of soil, uh, the, all those conditions kind of uh, add up to that terroir. Uh, and it's very important, and that's why only certain places in the world can produce world-class wines, and it's just not from anywhere that can grow grapes, because you really need that right balance. Uh, to have the right amount of acidity and sweetness and get to the the grapes to that level of ripeness where they're able to be produced into wine. And then you have to have a really special terroir to be produced into world-class wine. So as the climate around the world starts shifting, and how does that affect that idea of terroir? Are different wineries trying to move their operations to be able to sell the same product, or are they shifting the types of products they're selling? Both of those are happening. Um, certain wineries are, you know, gravitating towards uh, locations that possibly were a little cooler and now now are starting to kind of warm up so that they're able to get more ripeness or the ripeness levels in the grapes are uh, more consistent in certain areas. Um, in other areas, it's where it's becoming now a little bit too hot for the wine production. Some of these areas, they've changed the grape varieties they've, they're growing to kind of um, complement the actual climate conditions a little bit more. The more noticeable to me is the areas that were not viably produced prior and now are becoming a, a little bit more viable, which is a, a good thing in the short term, but uh, for some people, but bad thing, I think, overall for all of us. And then when we think about the question of, of Napa in particular and it becoming a drier uh, and hotter climate, we seem to be hearing different views on whether that's going to be good or bad for the region. Like you can read articles about how climate change is going to make Cabernet Sauvignon not viable in Napa in the next 20, 30 years. But then on the other hand, you have people who are saying, oh, no, it's going to allow us to essentially grow more saturated, flavorful wines. Um, that would be a, a good argument to have with certain people. But I mean, not, yes, it's true. Brighter, warmer, hotter weather produces uh, grapes that kind of will get riper. But we're really lucky in both Napa and Sonoma because we don't have just one climate. There's all, a lot of microclimates. So those different areas will benefit or, uh, or have issues one way or the other. Some of those areas will kind of uh, have um, maybe uh, more vigor or more production uh, from the area because of it's a little bit warmer and it heats things up. In other areas, it might turn those grapes into raisins a little prematurely. <laughs> the, the heat is generally not going to be good because eventually it's just going to get too hot. And you need to have the grapes get to a place where they actually have a, where the, they're ripe. And if they get too ripe too quick, it's not like you can just pick them. They need to be physiologically ripe. That's why California is a, 
really kind of tricky. And the, the, what we've, we've kind of dealt with it well, but that's where those microclimates really come into play. In areas like the Sonoma Coast, where you have cooler weather or fog in the morning, like that really helps benefit the, the grapes. So I was reading before we came here, um, and tell me if this is wrong, but I heard that a lot of people uh, believe that in order to be able to extract the true terroir, you shouldn't be uh, essentially irrigating your vineyard. So if you're dry farming and your climate's changing, are you more or less screwed or how are you going to navigate that situation? The whole idea behind that philosophy really kind of lies in the behavior of the root structure in these grape vines. So if you're watering them or irrigating them, the gr- the vines and the roots just grow right to where that water is. So that's typically going to be pretty near the surface. So they don't grow, grow deep. If it's a dry farm, the benefit there is that these vines their roots go deep down into the soil oh, and they find that water that's locked in well below, maybe 10, 20 feet below the surface level. And that really helps benefit the terroir because it's getting in between these rocks and in the soil and it's breaking it apart. It's actually becoming you know, part of the whole biosphere. And that's really important. If you're irrigating, it's it's easy and you can control it. And uh, you know, you might see quite a bit of uh, upside, but um, it, it is kind of a short-term solution. That's super unintuitive. So you're saying the people that are dry farming are probably most poised to be resilient in the coming years? 100%. They didn't used to have irrigation, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's it's new and that's what they, you look at all these old, very successful farms that have been around for hundreds of years and a lot of them are dry farmed. You know, now people talk about, you know, with the weather and the change. So people start talking about, oh, we can just do it, um, you know, hydroponically. Well, you, you could, but you can't grow enough grapes hydroponically to be a viable winery at this state. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a lot of space. Look at these vineyards, uh, how big and how vast they are. They're not big and vast because they want to show off their grandioseness. They just need that much acreage to produce as much wine as they're selling. Those places that are, that are uh, you know, dry farming, it's some, some of them are situated in a better place. So we talk with Peter about uh, the impact of wildfires on wines and the fact that they make them smoky. They can make a wine taste different. Are there other variables like that that can factor into the flavor of a wine that could potentially like ruin a batch or can make it unique in a certain way? You know, it would be kind of... Um short-sighted to think or to want that to happen uh, because you don't want to be influenced by some wildfires. Um, Yeah, there there is a certain amount of ash layer that comes down and kind of coats everything. Depends on when that, what's going on in the vineyard. If you're in harvest when that's happening, I mean, just you have ash. And once the ash hits liquid, you can't see it anymore. So it becomes an invisible kind of flavor profile. It also coats the barrels you know, which are constantly respirating, even though you wouldn't think that. So you're getting that kind of that smokiness in the wine. And there are some wines that, you know, I've talked to about or tasted and noticed hints of smokiness and that, that I haven't noticed in those wines previously. And you weren't, you weren't told you were just able to tell when you drank it. Yeah. You know, I kind of was like, oh, that has a little bit of smokiness. I looked at the vineyard or the vintage, realized this was like one of the years that we had a big fire. Their wine was kind of around that area because it's years later. You're not tasting that in the wine like immediately unless you're the winemaker where you're able to taste it constantly. But if you're just a a person who's buying wine off the shelf, that's years after the fact. So sometimes you have to look back in the in the calendar and see what was happening then. What what were the influences? Yes. Yeah, so how does that affect pricing? Like, is that is it like a unique wine that people want more of, or is it kind of tainted? Just like any wine, some people like certain aspects of it. Some people don't like those aspects. It's it's a, typically will drive the prices up, not because of the influence of the smoke, but because there's going to be less wine because there was a disastrous wildfire in the area. Mm-hmm. So people lost product, uh, people lost time, people lost buildings. So a, a, anytime anything happens, the prices go up and they'll never come down. And correct me if I'm wrong, but wines are like heavily blended, right? So some wines. So would it not be easy to basically dilute the smoky or whatever flavor is coming into your wine by just spreading that parcel of land that was impacted more more thin amongst the others? It just depends on maybe all your parcels were affected. 
But uh, I mean, this isn't something that winemakers are. I'm sure, yes, it's a very big concern. But you're you have so many other problems, and you're just probably happy that you didn't burn down. Yeah. So you know you're going to work through it. You're going to see what how fermentation after you bring those grapes in, how that's going to affect the flavor, and then you'll go from there. I mean, there's some very famous wines, uh, well, relatively famous in certain parts of the world. One in particular is called Pinotage, and it has this kind of always has this uh, kind of aroma of campfire. Like if you just took your sweater on, put it on the next day after like being at a bonfire, it's that kind of smell. And it just has it. It's it's intrinsic value of that grape. And that's one of its identifiers. So some people love that. Some people can't stand it. Some people don't notice it. So in California, we're super well acquainted with this issue of wildfires. And that's why that's like the main thing that stands out to us. But what are people experiencing in other parts of the world? Well, I mean, drought, wildfire, floods, those things are all you know, super destructive. Like you were speaking about earlier, the winemaking and this whole business is based on agriculture. So they have the same kind of issues as we see the farmers all around talking about. Uh, we've had, you know, back uh, hundreds of years ago, we had uh, phylloxera, which was an epidemic that almost destroyed all wine production in Europe. And that heavily affected what we're the choices we were making here in America at that time because that's when all of a sudden brandy got really expensive, and that's when we started producing our own spirits here, and you know the wine production domestically kind of sprung from that. So a lot of our listeners are also investors, you know, agriculture investors, and it seems like a lot of investment activity is happening in the wine industry where. Companies are trying to acquire estates, which might be more fruitful for growing one grape varietal versus the other. So where would you advise our listeners who might be investors to focus their attention to? Um, He's not going to give up his trade secrets. Well, <laughs> you, you know, what, what I've noticed. Uh, in Siberia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, wherever you see yourself wanting to be um, and spend time, because that's basically what they're going to end up buying is, uh, you know, it's not you, you do get to buy this. Uh, beautiful commodity that can travels well or travels let's not say well and you can take it with you but part of being an investor in a winery or a wine a vineyard would be to visit it and spend time there so it depends on where you would like to be uh, and then you know if that's in you know look at the trends i mean california it's very, very it, it's it just depends on what your tastes are as well really but california is very expensive in certain areas but maybe you could kind of predict on the climate maps and see what the next uh, you know gem is going to be Mm. That's cool. It's a good idea. Yeah, we know where to, where to get the <laughs> next Cabernet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I've noticed, and again, getting back to owning a winery, it's really about um, you're not necessarily going to make a ton of money, per se, in a winery, but you're going to have great parties. <laughs> Which is the important part. Well, you Happiness know, is the end goal. It is. And I mean, so you have this beautiful space to entertain and, you know, it, it, the wines are and, and enjoy the wines, but you get the write off. And, uh, you know, that's that's what it's all about. There you go. So a big trend in the agriculture uh, sector has been organic. And the rest of the world and the rest of the crops get a premium for organic. But a lot of times I've been reading that organic wines, at least when they first started coming out, were being like devalued in price because it was assumed that if they're organic, they're not going to be as good. Well, you know, there's this uh, hard thing that wines have gone through in kind of the, some of the governing bodies to determine what is organic mm -hmm. and what those words really mean. And so just to put any words on your label is very difficult and needs a lot of different approvals. So it started off with being like organically grown grapes, but that didn't say that you were using all organic processes in the winery. And then there was organically made wines. And those wines, by kind of rule then, said that they weren't able to add any other product during the production to the, the, the juice. And um, one of those things is adding, which commonly is used in a lot of wineries, is the addition of sulfur. And we're talking about, a most of the time, we're talking about a very minute amount, maybe 20 milliliters to a ton of grape juice. So it's just a little bit in a graduated cylinder that's added to kind of neutralize the active yeast cultures and what any bacteria that has come in so that you're able to kind of introduce the yeast cultures that you would like to kind of work with in that grape or that production that you're having. 
Um, so when wineries weren't able to use that sulfur, they had a lot of wild uh, fermentations, which sometimes works really well. Sometimes you're having fermentations by bacteria or yeast that are not um, going to be good representations of the quality of wine that you have. Uh, so that was a real factor. So you got this, you know, what's now is really, you know, popular is these natural wine uh, kind of movement. It's very, it's very interesting to me to see people really cling, clinging to and, you know, this demand for natural wine, where a lot of people see those as faults that they thought that they'd worked their way through. So there's a, it's just that right balance of, you know, using some product, but not using too much in some ways. Sorry, that was a little... No, that makes sense. And and like, what is... I mean, obviously, this is just this is your personal opinion, but what does sustainability mean in the in the wine sector? Like, it seems to me that wineries are maybe not wineries. I don't know enough about wineries, but these vineyards seem to be pretty sustainable already. Just from like, if you look at it from a first principles level, like if you guys are even going through and clipping off berries sometimes so that you can get better flavors, is it? Unfortunately, I don't know if your investors are going to love to hear this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, there's a ton of uh, water wasted at wineries. It's just the natural, per- you know, you have to rinse everything down. Uh, so that's really a, an issue um, that happens quite often with wineries. Uh, so sustainability is really tough. What I think, in my humble opinion, is if you want to be sustainable, it's not about being organic. It's about taking the next step, which would be being biodynamic. And biodynamic is uh, principles that you can't, be just a little of. You're not a little biodynamic. You're. It's 100% buy-in, and that helps with your sustainability about how you treat your paper in the office of your building. What happens to all your water and how it's recaptured, reclaimed? How you go about fertilizing your fields? The kind of pests and positive pests that you bring in to promote healthy grape development, birds, animals, all those things. So I really think that's the true key to sustainability in the wine business or any agriculture business if possible. Yeah. And this term biodynamic, is there like a definitive framework around what that is or is it sort of like organic and sustainable where it's, it's, it's different super, for different people? It's super structured, super defined. It's a very, uh, it's a process that you go through. It's seven years process to get certified biodynamic um, and it's uh, an agency called Demeter is the one that kind of does that. It's a European based uh, system and it's it's really a huge huge uh, asset to making high quality wine and having the ability to have uh, your winemakers footprints in the vineyard which are going to be the basis of having you know, them have the most knowledge of what's going on and then being able to produce the highest quality of grapes. Got it. So for them, it's they're getting their ROI back. It's not a matter of like trying to label it as weird biodynamic. It's just that it's more profitable for them for the most part. Well, you use no pesticide, no fertilizers. So this was a way that wineries, especially impoverished winemakers, had to act. And so these are some of those things that have developed from roots of being just a traditional winemaker because they didn't have the money or the access to fertilizer and pesticides and things along those lines. Maybe we should organize a wine tasting event, you know, sit by you and inviting a lot of industry CEOs and talking about climate change in the wines. I mean, that is a, a, definitely a great way to bring a <laughs> bunch of people together. Uh, you know, uh, free wine or uh, food definitely work in. And, you know, that is a lot of the stuff that we do at, at Salesforce. And, you know, we're not necessarily focused on how these wines uh, 100% are impacted and how these different meetings go, but I'm always thinking about it and I'm a supporter of wines that I um, know being biodynamic, being organic, uh, just that process. Sometimes sometimes they don't want to even label it, but I know them personally and I believe in their product and I see the kind of work that they put into their, their vineyards. And that's the only way to get uh, the highest quality grapes, which then maybe you have the possibility of making high quality wine. But without having the highest quality grapes, you really are um, behind the eight ball already. If you'd like to be invited to this executive only event, you can reach out to me at Borna. <laughs> <laughs> so how can people support what you're doing either at Salesforce or in your class or just in your life in general? You got anything you want to you got a platform here. You know, drink, uh, drink good wine. Uh, <laughs> d- don't waste, don't waste time. Uh, but you know, the, what I really try to get across to my students, and I think this is a great tool, is when it comes to wine, know what you like, know why you like it, and never be afraid to try something new. Uh, and those are three principles that I always try to apply to wines.
for listeners who don't have a chance didn't have a chance to attend your class and that includes me <laughs> um, what all resources would you recommend to learn more about about wines you know we're here very lucky because we're surrounded by wineries uh, i mean you can go just 30 minutes from here to los gatos and go visit a handful of wineries there santa cruz mountains uh, you don't have to go to napa or sonoma to kind of dip your toes in um and and check it out. I I think there's not one favorite winery I have necessarily. I think people should just visit them all. Uh and you know find your own favorite. You know, it's not about necessarily like oh these people have the most amazing wine all the time, uh which I think you'll find out as you experiment more and try more things. Sometimes it's really about the situation, the occasion, the view, the veranda, uh you know the company you had uh playing bocce, you know they they're all designed to have this amazing entertainment values. So that's the way I think if you kind of uh search for those and and try the all the different wineries and you know maybe sample the wines while you're there that's a good good way to kind of educate yourself and what if you're not from northern california come visit <laughs> there you go you got a space on aj's couch if you'd like to come yeah. visit. <laughs> uh you know almost every state you know has uh has wine production it's uh you know you find people are very very proud if they're if they come from idaho you know they typically think Idaho wines are the best and that's great uh, they're they're good they're everybody's kind of um has a lot of fun with it awesome okay well thank you so much for your time that was a really useful and fun conversation absolutely thank you guys Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you have any feedback or you'd like to add your own two cents on the topic discussed today, or if you've just got your own ideas about something that we should discuss in the future, please feel free to shoot me an email at podcast at climate.ai. At its core, this podcast is just a way for us to learn and we want to share our learnings as we go. So we're always open to building on these conversations and hearing new perspectives. Thanks for your support and see you next time.